بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد in our last uh, lesson we began discussing the life of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq رضي الله تعالى عن his lineage his background his family tribe today we'll talk a little bit about what we know pre-Islam and his conversion to Islam so a little bit of the stories that we know uh, and of course as we will discover, uh, if even with the Prophet Muhammad we have just a little bit of information from the Meccan era. As I have said so many times, the Madani era, even though it is only 10 years, and the Meccan era is 53 years total, we actually have almost double the amount of information for those 10 years that we do for the 53 years all combined. Because that's the nature of compiling information. If this is for our Rasulullah how much more so for the Sahaba? So you will see that the fact of the matter, we have very little information that has been preserved, just tidbits. And as we go on from Sahabi to Sahabi, information will go less and less and less. For the bulk of the Sahaba, we only have their name. And for many of them, not even their name has been recorded. The, the masses of the Sahaba, more than 100,000 people saw the Prophet them. Most of their names are not even known, correct? Who's going to record them? It's gone. So even from the names, we have around maybe 5,000 names. From those 5,000 of names that we have, probably we only have stories enough to make a biography of less than 100, 150. And even that to make a, a class out of, probably, I will probably end up doing maybe 30, 40, that's it. These are the immediate names and maybe some interesting anecdotes from one, one anecdote from one person. He entered the life of the process as an emissary. Something interesting happened. Maybe we will do that. So we will see less and less information. What do we know about Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an? We know that he was always curious and open-minded. He never worshipped idols. He was looking for the truth even as a young man. And as Suyuti reports in his uh, tarikh, in his biography, a story that Abu Bakr himself narrated. That he said that once in the days of Jahiliyyah, uh, I was sitting in front of the Kaaba, And Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl was also there. Who is Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl? Who is Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl? Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, his name should be known. Louder. Somebody from the back. The most famous of the Hunafa. The most famous of the Hunafa. Who's the Hunafa? Please tell me you all know the Hunafa. The ones who never worshipped idols, right? The most famous of them was Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. And I gave his story at the beginning of the seerah. Our Prophet ﷺ met Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. And he asked him that, why do my people have a problem with you? What is going on? And so he said, I don't worship any of these false gods. I worship only uh, Allah Azza wa Jal. I, I turn to the God of Ibrahim. You know, I don't eat the meat given uh, to the I idols and whatnot. So he was very angry at idolatry. This is Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. He had traveled the world. He had traveled to Syria and to Yemen and whatnot. And he had rejected Judaism and Christianity as being false. And he said, none of you are upon the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam anymore. There is no that religion left Hanifiyya. He was the most famous. And by the way, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl is a first cousin of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar ibn al-Khattab ibn Nufayl. Okay, so Khattab and Amr are brothers. So Zayd and Umar ibn al-Khattab are first cousins. But of course, there's a huge age gap, maybe even 50 years or more, or 40, year, 40, 40 years or more of an age gap between Zayd and Umar, different generations. But they are first cousins, both from the Banu Adi. Uh, so Abu Bakr is sitting there, and Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl was there. And as he's sitting, and Zayd is there, Umayya ibn Abu Salt passes by. Now, you wouldn't know Umayya ibn, ibn Abu Salt. We just mentioned his name very briefly in the seerah. Uh, and Umayya ibn Abu Salt was the most famous poet and Hanif from the Thaqif tribe, not the Quraysh. So the Thaqif, the Ta'if tribe. Ibn Abu Salt. And Ibn Abu Salt, by the way, uh, he as well met the Prophet وسلم, as a prophet. And the Prophet وسلم, asked him to recite some poetry. And he heard the poetry of Ibn Abi Salt. And he invited him to Islam. And Ibn Abi Salt basically said, let me think about it. And for the rest of his life, he continued to think about it. 
until he died in a state of thinking about it. Means he didn't reject, but he didn't accept, and not accepting is rejecting in our religion, right? And our Prophet ﷺ said that as for Umayyah ibn Abi Salt, Kada and Yuslim, he was just so close to accepting Islam. But Allah Azza wa Jal knows best what was the reason. Some say, some say that uh, he wanted to embrace Islam, but he uh, felt jahili uh, problems of Thaqif versus Quraysh. Some say this, that that was his main issue, that why should the Prophet be amongst the Quraysh? And I'm from the Thaqif. Uh, and another reason given is that uh, he lost his closest friends at Badr. And he felt like it would be betraying their memory. Uh, because the leaders of the Quraysh were his friends in the days of Jahiliyyah. So uh, the point being, he did not accept Islam. But he was also a Hanif. And he did not embrace uh, idol idolatry. He did not worship the false gods. So Zayd, who is the most famous Hanif of the Quraysh, now... Uh, Ibn Abi Salt is coming from Ta'if, he's doing Tawaf, so the two of them meet. And Abu Bakr is looking at them as a young man. Abu Bakr is listening to their conversation. So Ibn Abi Salt uh, basically says to him, you know, how are you doing, what not? Have you found the Sabil, the Tariq? In other words, have you found the truth yet? Have you found the truth yet? And uh, Zayd Ibn Amr ibn Ufayl recited some poetry back at him, saying that every religion uh, was incorrect other than the religion of the Hanifiya, which is the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Then he said, Zayd said to Ibn Abi Salt, this prophet that we are waiting for, he will either come from my tribe or yours. So Zayd is telling Ibn Abi Salt that because they had both traveled in the land. If you remember the story, I had given it in the beginning of the seerah, a group of people, maybe uh, when the Prophet was a very young ma man, maybe even before he was born, we don't know exactly when, a group of people decided to travel in the world seeking the true religion. And therefore they went to Syria, they went to Yemen. So Zaid is one of them. And they come back and each one goes a separate way. And Zaid says, we know there's a prophet coming. His prediction has been given. He will be from either my tribe or your tribe. So Abu Bakr is narrating the story. He said, I had never heard of anyone called a prophet. What is a prophet? Nabi. The word Nabi I had never heard. And this is another theological point. That the concept of prophethood was unknown to the Arabs. It was not something they were familiar with. And that is why the Quran keeps on mentioning that a Nabi has come that ma unzira aba'uhum min qabl. They didn't get a prophet before, right? No Nabi came to them before. And so many hadith mentioned that the, the, the Quraysh are asking, what is a Nabi? Wa ma Nabi? What is a Nabi? We never heard of this. So Abu Bakr said, I didn't know what is a Nabi. So I went to the most knowledgeable person in Mecca. Who is the most knowledgeable person in Mecca? Waraqa ibn Nawfal. Waraqa ibn Nawfal. He was a person who thought about these things and looked into the books. So Waraqa had prestige amongst the people. I went to Waraqa ibn Nawfal and I stopped him and asked him that what is this thing called a Nabi? For I heard Zayd saying to Ibn Abi Salt that a Nabi is coming. So Waraqa said, yes indeed my nephew. We, the three of us, are indeed a people of knowledge and a book, meaning we're not upon your religion. We believe in a different religion. We're not upon the religion of idolatry. But we are all waiting for a prophet to come, who is the best of the Arabs. And your people, and of course he is also a Qurashi, so he's saying our people are the best of the Arabs, so they will, he will come from amongst us. So Waraqa even said, not even from Thaqif, he must come from us. Because the prediction was Banu Ismail, and the most prestigious of Banu Ismail is the Quraysh. So Waraqa was even certain it cannot be the Thaqif, it must be us. And so Abu Bakr uh, asked him, what is a Nabi then? Ma Nabi? And Waraqa says, a Nabi is the one who tells others what he is told to say. It's a definition of a Nabi. In other words, Allah is telling him and he will spread. And... لا يظلم ولا يظلم ولا يظلم. He doesn't do injustice. And injustice is not done to him. And he does not basically support injustice or cooperate with injustice. Abu Bakr then says, So when the Prophet ﷺ was sent, 
I immediately believed in him and trusted him. Meaning, these types of conversations had prepared him for the coming of the Nabi. That he's searching for the truth. And this shows us, again, this is just a tidbit. The fact that he's actually sitting behind Zayd ibn Amr. And Zayd ibn Amr was a pariah. He was a taboo person to go to. Because you're not supposed to be sitting with this person who is a deviant. He's a heretic. The fact that he's sitting there listening. And Ibn Abi Salt comes and he's engaging in the conversation. Now he's a young man. He doesn't, he's not going to thrust himself in their conversation. But he knows he can go somewhere. So he walks to another source of knowledge. All of this indicates what? That he is open to searching for the truth. He doesn't, he's not satisfied with the jahili uh, manners. And... Another incident as well that we know of from before the coming of uh, uh, the Prophet ﷺ and his message, that one, one time, uh, many years later, after the Prophet ﷺ began preaching in the, in the Madani phase, the Prophet ﷺ asked the Sahaba, who amongst you remembers the statements of Qus ibn Sa'ida at Uqqav? Qus ibn Sa'ida at Uqqav. Now, what is all of this going on here? Firstly, Uqqav. What is Uqqav? Uqqav is the post Hajj Suq at Mina. Ukal, there was a land outside of uh, after Hajj season where for a few weeks all of the Hujjaj would gather and they would buy and sell and they would have competitions and they would have poetry contests. This is the Suq al Ukal. So the Suq al Ukal was an annual event the highlight of all of the Arabian Peninsula because this is the only time everybody's coming. It becomes a fair, a bargaining, a selling, a merchandise. All of this is happening in the Suq Ukkav. And our Prophet utilized Ukkav for his da'wah many, many years. But before his da'wah, he would just go like everybody else. And at one of these times, before the da'wah began, before the age of 40, our Prophet wasallam met there uh, this person by the name of Qus ibn Sa'idah. Qus ibn Sa'idah is under, another one of those famous pre-Islamic Arabs. And Qus ibn Sa'idah came from uh, Tihama. Came from Tihama. And he only came once in the lifetime of the Prophet as far as we know, for Hajj. And Qus ibn Sa'idah, it, it is said that he was the most eloquent of all of the Arabs of his time. And he was known for a nathr. And a nathr, uh, I know the Arabs here who know Balagha are going to cringe when I say this. But the closest thing I can think of is rap. The closest thing I can think of is rap. What do I mean by this? Nathr is not poetry. Nathr is using words in a rhythmic manner. Which is very much like rap. Very much so, because that's really what it is. It's not metered lines. It's not like the couplet style. This is a different style. And Qus ibn Sa'ida was known as the master of this discipline, of al nathr And he was also a Hanif. He was also a Hanif. And uh, he gave some phrases in the Suq of Uqqav that the Prophet ﷺ was impressed by. He liked what he had heard from Qus ibn Sa'ida. And uh, by the way, he was from the tribe of Iyad, Banu Iyad. And when the Banu Iyad came to embrace Islam, many, many, many years later, the Prophet immediately said to them, where is Qus ibn Sa'ida? And so they said he passed away so, so many years ago, gave him the story that he had already passed away. So the Prophet remembered Qus ibn Sa'ida and he wanted information about him. So he asked the, the Sahaba, who amongst you remembers what Qus ibn Sa'idah said to us that day, the nathr that he said, the, the talk that he said. And so immediately Abu Bakr said, Ana ya Rasulullah. So out of all of the Sahaba, Abu Bakr was the one who had memorized it. And uh, he immediately began to recite the nathr. Ayyuhan uh, nas, isma'u, wa'u, wa idha wa'itum fantafi'u. Ayyuhan nas, isma'u, wa'u, wa idha wa'itum fantafi'u. O you, O, o mankind, listen and understand. And once you have understand, then benefit. So even when I say it in Arabic, you see basically what I mean by, by rap. Inna man asha mat, wa man mata fat, wa kullu ma huwa atin at. 
This is nathar, right? Inna man mata fat. Translate. Sorry, inna man asha mat. Whoever is going to live is going to die. Inna man asha mat. There is no life without death, right? Inna man asha mat. Waman mata fat. And whoever dies has gone, perished. Nothing is left. Wa kullu ma huwa atin at. And everything that has been decreed is going to come to pass. Okay? Uh, so, and then uh, he goes on, inna fi sama ila khabara wa inna fil ardi la ibara. So, he, this is what nathar is. Okay? You see for yourself, powerful phrases that are profound in meaning, but they are not poetry. And he goes on and on in this regard until Abu Bakr finished narrating the entire nathar. Now, what is the show about Abu Bakr as Siddiq? Great memory, amazing memory, that for him to simply memorize all of this and be able to regurgitate it after listening to it once, amazing memory. It also shows that he's eager, he's paying attention, because in this poetry, in this nathar, which I don't have, the, I didn't write all the Arabic because there's no need going into that, he also criticizes idolatry. And he mentions the religion of Ibrahim as being the real religion. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is memorizing all of this. And these are just some examples and there are so many other examples that are more trivial than this. So I just overlook them because the fact of the matter is we don't have that much. We just have one or two small things here and there. So we don't, uh, so we don't know too much other than the fact from these stories we derive eagerness of Abu Bakr. Paying attention to theological discussions of his time. So he's waiting for the truth. And that is why when the truth came in the form of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq did not hesitate one bit. Unfortunately, we do not have the details of the initial conversation between the Prophet and Abu Bakr. We don't know. Because there was only two people there, neither of them told us the details of that conversation. However, what we do know is that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq did not hesitate one bit. I quoted the hadith last week that the Prophet Sallallahu one time when this issue happened between uh, Abu, uh, Umar and Uthman, our Prophet Sallallahu said that every one of you when I was sent to you and I told you Allah has sent me, every one of you hesitated before accepting Islam. Other than Abu Bakr, he did not hesitate and he embraced. So we know then from this hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu his call to Abu Bakr was immediately accepted without any hesitation. And it is mentioned, Aisha later on narrates, maybe Abu Bakr told her, maybe her mother told her, we do not know. Aisha, because she was not alive at this time when, when Abu Bakr converted. Aisha narrated that uh, when Abu Bakr converted, the happiest person in all of Mecca was the Prophet Wasallam that his best friend had converted. And there is no doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the perfect companion and the perfect helper for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So many things in similarity, their natures, their characteristics, even their birth dates. Uh, we don't know exactly when Abu Bakr was born, but a year, a year and a half younger than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So that's like a very camaraderie age. So they grow up together, basically aqran, similar Age, and they are the best of friends even before the da'wah begins. So Allah Azza wa Jal chose for our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the best of all helpers and what a helper he was. Just look at what he did immediately after conversion. Look at the list of his early converts, one after the other. It is a list of who's who's of Islam. The most famous names of early Islam and of late Islam. They converted at the hands of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, beginning with Zubayr ibn al-Awwam, and Uthman ibn Affan, and Talha ibn Ubaidillah, and Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, and Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. All of these are from the Ashra Mubashara. So five of the Ashra Mubashara, at least, are converting by the hands of Abu Bakr. Allah Azza wa guides them through the hands of Abu Bakr. Imagine, of the ten best people, Abu Bakr was the one Allah chose that five of them will be guided at his hands. 
and of course others as well besides this as we know Bilal uh, and Uthman ibn Mav'un and Al-Arqam uh, ibn Al-Arqam so Al-Arqam the one who's in whose house the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was meeting with the Sahaba even Al-Arqam converted at the hands of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and of course along with this his entire immediate family as well converted to Islam uh, his wife Umm Ruman uh, his son and daughter from his previous marriage and their names are everybody should know Abdullah and Asma, and then his son and daughter from his current Umm Ruman, and they are Aisha and Abdul Rahman. Aisha is going to be born in a while, so she was born in Islam. Aisha herself says, I never remembered my parents except upon Islam. So she never saw the day of Jahiliyyah. Asma did and Abdullah did, but not Aisha. She was born into Islam. And Abu Bakr's servant, Amir ibn Fuhaira. So his entire household embraces Islam. As I said last week, the only household, everybody embraces Islam. From the parents to the children to the servants is the household of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And it is unanimously agreed by all the scholars of Islam that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was the first adult convert to Islam from amongst the men. This is unanimous. There is the ikhtilaf in tartib for those who are non-adults and non uh, uh, and, and female. So who converted first? Ali or Abu Bakr? There's a bit of a contro controversy. Okay. Uh, in terms of Khadija, everybody knows Khadija converted first because the Prophet came back to her and so Zambilu, Zambiluni. So Khadija is definitely the first convert. Okay, then there's a big controversy, and in my humble opinion, and many scholars say this, this controversy is really insignificant in the larger scale of things. It's really one group of Islam, they want to like push their way and say, he converted, he converted. In the end of the day, it's really irrelevant. It's a matter of hours or days, and if Ali was the first of the children who converted, because his age now is probably eight years old at max, seven, eight years old. And he's living, uh, and I said the story before, that when the Prophet married uh, Khadija, he told Abu Talib to give him one of the children so that he could raise, because Abu Talib was a very poor man. And so uh, the Prophet volunteered to raise one of the children. So Ali grew up in the household of the Prophet and this is a blessing. Wallahi, we give and we give much more than this. There is this per perception that, astaghfirullah, we are miserly and stingy when it comes to praising Ali ibn Abi Talib. And wallahi, this is a lie. We praise Ali ibn Abi Talib the way he deserves to be praised. And we give him every single blessing that he deserves. And of the blessings, he grew up in the household of the Prophet And maybe he converted before Abu Bakr or maybe Abu Bakr before him. But in the end of the day, Ali was a young child when he converted. And the conversion of a child who's living in the household of two people who are converted is not the same as the conversion of an adult friend and that has to be said frankly that even if Ali converted first and we don't know we don't know but even if he did radiallahu an, the conversion of a young lad living in a house where both man and woman his uncle and aunt or his cousin and his cousin-in-law convert is not the same as the conversion of an adult friend who is offered Islam and he has to think about it and without thinking and hesitating he immediately embraces so Ali radiallahu anhu might have been time-wise earlier convert, or maybe not, we don't know, but we all unanimously agree that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was the first adult male convert uh, in Islam. And along with converting all of these other people, he also sacrificed much for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, financially, and even of his own health and his own uh, jihad, fi sabilillah, even in the Meccan uh, stage. And one of the most famous stories that I did mention uh, four and a half years ago, but now we have to repeat it because wallahi it is befitting that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq be given this honor. That one of the earliest stories that we have in Ibn Ishaq about Abu Bakr as-Siddiq is that when Islam reached 38 men, so they're counting and keeping track, when Islam reached 38 men in Darul Arqam, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq suggested to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that it was now time to go public. This was in the secret phase, or the proper term is not secret, but rather private da'wah. Remember I talked about this, right? It's not good to say secret da'wah, we say private da'wah. Everybody knows what's going on, it's not a secret, but it has not gone public yet. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq said, we have enough people to go now public. Let us go to the Kaaba and let me invite the people to Islam. And at this point in time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not revealed to the Prophet Muhammad to go himself public. 
Which ayah was that? That he could go public? Which ayah is in the Quran? وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ This is the ayah that could go public with. This ayah had not yet come down. So the question is, should Abu Bakr go public or not? An ayah is not going to come down for that. So the Prophet was hesitant. Should I let you go? Should I not let you go? Abu Bakr insisted. I can do the job. It's time we take this message public. Let's call the people. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq volunteered to become the first khatib ever of Islam. This is the first khutbah ever given publicly. The first sermon, the first mawidah in front of the masses. Because Allah has not revealed to the Prophet Muhammad SAW to go public yet, right? He cannot. As we know, prophets cannot undertake a step until Allah tells them, right? So Abu Bakr as Siddiq wants to do it, and it's up to the Prophet SAW to see whether he should let him or not. Initially, he's hesitant, and Abu Bakr insists, I want to do this, let me take on. And so, uh, they agree on a certain time and place and all of the Sahaba they go and they station themselves in their tribal gatherings. Now what does this mean? So remember every tribe had a place in front of the Kaaba and that was their safe, basically they're surrounded by numbers. They're going to be protected by their people. And the amazing thing is that even in their hatred of Islam, tribalism reigns supreme, especially in early Islam. That's why they couldn't harm the Prophet ﷺ for 13 years. That's why they could not harm the elite of the Sahaba and they took their anger out on Bilal and Ammar and Yasir and Sumayya, right? That's why this happened. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq volunteered and he went to the middle of the, of the Maidan al-Ka'bah, in front of the Kaaba. Nobody there other than Allah Azza wa to, to protect him. And he began giving the first Maw'idah in all the history of Islam. So this is a trick question. Who is the first khatib of Islam? And the first one to give a public lecture? It is Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he invited the people to give up their idols and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believe in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And of course everybody knows there's a new message, right? We, know, we, we said this. But nobody has gone public yet. And they surround Abu Bakr, they begin to curse him, they begin to tell him to be quiet, but he does not be quiet until the first one of them, and we know his name, and that is the infamous Utbah uh, ibn al-Rabi'ah, Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah who has done so much, so much to the Prophet and he died at the Battle, the battle of Badr. He was one of those that the Prophet pointed, you know, the seven people that did the incident with the... Uh, the, the camel, right? So the Prophet pointed, and he mentioned by name, Oh Allah! I put you in charge of this. And he mentioned each one of them by name. And so Utbah is one of those people. And in this we see his real character and nature. That he was the one. Now everybody's worried who's going to be the first. But you know when there's a mob mentality, as soon as one thing breaks out, what happens? Khalas, everybody jumps on him. So Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah took off his shoes and pounced on Abu Bakr with both hands. And he began beating Abu Bakr with both hands. And that was the catalyst that the entire crowd just jumped on Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and a complete mob chaos began so much so that eventually Abu Bakr fell into the crowd onto the crowd and the crowd began stomping and beating up on Abu Bakr until he lost consciousness and his entire body was bloodied and bruised cuts on his face because of the the shoes that was being smacked across his face until finally his tribe the Banu Taim were informed Abu Bakr is at, uh, from the Banu Taim of the Quraysh I said that last week a small sub-tribe not as elite as the Banu Hashim Banu Umayyah and, and, and yet of a good status of the, of the middle of them and so the tribe the Banu Tamim sorry not Tamim Banu Taim the Banu, Banu Tamim is another tribe, the Quraysh is another tribe. The Banu Tamim come, came running and they protected Abu Bakr and they had to carry him in a shawl of one of them. So he was so injured, they have to use like an ambulance basically. They have to use something. And his father thought that he would die because he was completely bloodied and unconscious. And they brought him back to the house of his uh, mother and they announced that if Abu Bakr dies, we will kill Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah. Okay, and this shows us that jahili tendencies had some advantages as well. That they're so angry that they have harmed one of our own, that they're going to declare war against one of the most conspicuous 
members of the Quraysh, and that is Utba ibn Rabi'a. And his father, Abu Quhafa, is you know, coaxing him on his bed. You know, he's in the house now, back on his bed. He's telling Abu Bakr, wake up, wake up. You know the, the, what we would do when he's unconscious. And Abu Bakr is completely bloodied, head to toe, completely bruised. And he opens his eyes up. And the first thing that comes out of his mouth is, how is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How is Rasulullah? Means he's lost consciousness and he thinks all of the Muslims have been attacked. Because he's in the middle of the mob. Right? He does not know that the rest of the Muslims have not been attacked. He's in the middle of the mob. He thinks everybody has been attacked. So, when his father hears this from tenderness and love, immediate 180 to cursing and getting angry. And this really shows us the bizarre nature really of parental love. Right? That no matter what Abu Bakr has done, in the end of the day he's a son. Right? And so, at this stage when Abu Bakr is dying, Abu Quhafa is like, wake up, wake up. As soon as he wakes up and he mentions Islam, subhanAllah, all the enmity comes back in, right? And only a parent can understand this love-hate relationship with, uh, with the uh, children. Uh, so uh, when he hears this, he just gets so angry and curses and he leaves Abu Bakr with the mother. And Abu Bakr's mother's name, by the way, her kunya was Umm al-Khair. Umm al-Khair, that is her kunya, Umm al-Khair. So he asks his mother, he asks his mother, Ma fa'ala Rasulullah How is the Prophet And his mother, now the mothers of course have a million times more love than the fathers, right? The fathers can, they have much more of a different relationship. Now the mother saying, eat, drink. And he says, no, until you tell me, how is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So his mother says, Wallahi ma adri ma fa'ala sahibuk. I don't know what is the status of your friend. I don't know what is his status. I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm in the house. You just come here. I don't know what is his status. So he says to her, go to Umm Jamil uh, bint al-Khattab, which is of course the sister of Umar bin al-Khattab. Go to Umm Jamil bint al-Khattab right now and ask her. Now because she's a lady, so Abu Bakr has to send her to another lady because he cannot go to a man and ask. So go to Umm Jamil bint al-Khattab. And ask her, is the Prophet ﷺ all right? And so what's she going to do? She's a mother, her son's not eating and drinking, he's insisting to know. So she puts on her garment and she goes right then and there to the house of Umm Jamil, the sister of Umar bin Khattab. And of course, Umm Jamil is a Muslim, but nobody's supposed to know that, right? It's secret, everybody's, a, it, it's the whole point, it's Dar al-Arqam stage, right? So. Umm al-Khair, Abu Bakr's mother, goes to Umm al-Jameel and says, My son is asking about the status of Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Because she's not going to say Rasulullah, she's not a Muslim. My son is asking, how is Muhammad ibn Abdullah doing? And Umm al-Jameel is now confused. Is this a trap? Is this a setup? What's going on? So she said, I neither know your son nor Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Meaning, what have I to do with these two men? Like, why are you coming to me? Of course, she knows who they are. Of course, she's Qurashi. But she, the point is like, why would I have any information about Abu Bakr or Muhammad ibn Abdullah? Okay? So she said, but he's insisting I come to you. So she opens up a little bit. She says, look, I don't know anything about the two of them. What if I come back with you and speak to Abu Bakr directly? Maybe then I'll figure out what he wants from me. Okay? So she's not, she's worried that I'm opening up to a stranger and I shouldn't open up. Maybe this is a trap or, or a setup. So she goes to the house of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and uh, when she sees the status of Abu Bakr and he falls into unconsciousness again and his whole body is limp and bloodied and bruised and bandaged and swelling everywhere. When she sees the status of Abu Bakr, she lets out a shriek and she says that whoever has done this to you, may Allah curse him, may Allah get revenge on him. How could a people do this to anybody, to their most noble person? So in her voice now, Abu Bakr then is managing to open his eyes and immediately he asks the same question. Ma fa'ala? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi How is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And uh, Umm Jamil says, your mother is here. Meaning, I can't answer this question. Okay, your mother is right there. So subhanAllah, look, there's so much like, you know, there's a, a secrecy. This is privacy here. Like, she's not supposed to know we're Muslims. And Abu Bakr as-Siddiq says, don't worry, we can trust her. 
So he knows his mother. She's not a Muslimah yet. But everybody knows their mother's soft spot. And Abu Bakr knew my mother's not going to betray us. Okay? Don't worry, we can trust our mother, uh, my mother. And so Umm Jamil says, Alhamdulillah, he is bikhay wa afi, he is fine, nothing happened to him. So he said, Where is he? So Umm Jamil said, In the house of Dar al Arqam. That's where we all congregated after what happened to you happened. We're all over there. So uh, his mother said, Now eat and drink. Khalas, now you know your sahab. Now look, this is the mother's love. Doesn't matter. She wants, now let me. So, and he said, Wallahi, I will not touch food and water until I see with my own eyes that the Prophet is fine. So um, what are they going to do now? He's sworn by Allah. He's not going to eat or drink anything. So they wait until darkness falls. This is now he's been bloodied and bruised. The same day, he does not want to eat and drink until he can verify that maybe she's just li lying to me or, or I'm not lying, I shouldn't say, but you know, just like, you know, kind of sifting over so that I can eat and drink. I want to verify that he is fine. And so bloodied and battered and bruised when it goes dark, one hand on his mother and the other hand on Umm Jameel. Right? And that, of course, at this time, the laws of hijab and whatnot have not been revealed. In any case, these are times of exceptional. What are you going to do at this time? He is dragged by the two of them. He cannot even walk. He is dragged by the two of them in the darkness of the night to the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abil Arqam. And when he falls, uh, when he sees uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he literally falls upon him and hugging him and crying him, uh, crying in his arms. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is greatly moved and distressed. And uh, the, uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq comforts the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and says, Wallahi Ya Rasulullah, I am absolutely fine, don't worry. Other than, and there were gashes from, you know, this was the uh, shoes was being put, there were gashes in his face. Other than this gash, everything else is fine. Even though he could couldn't even walk. He was bloodied and bruised. Imagine a crowd stomping, or a crowd kicking him. That's what they were doing. Until the Banu Taim come, at least 20-30 minutes must have gone by. And completely bloodied and bruised. But he's consoling the process. I'm fine, Ya Rasulullah, other than this uh, gash over here. And then uh, he says, Ya Rasulullah, here is my mother. Now for the first time she's coming to Dar al Arqam, right? Here is my mother and Allah Azza wa Jal has blessed you. Call her to Islam and make dua that Allah guides her to Islam. Maybe Allah Azza wa Jal will save her from Jahannam. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gives da'wah to Umm al Khair. And this is where she embraces Islam. So Abu Bakr's mother embraces Islam in the private stage of the da'wah. The first two, three years of Islam, Abu Bakr's mother embraces uh, Islam. And subhanAllah, from this incident, wallahi, and I mentioned this incident before when we we're talking about the trials of the Prophet Wasallam. but we see so many benefits and blessings. We see, obviously, the love that Abu Bakr Siddiq has for the Prophet Wasallam that he will not eat and drink until he physically has verified that the Prophet Wasallam is fine and, and safe, and as well the Prophet Sallallahu his love for Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. We also see uh, the intelligence of Umm Jamil, the sister of Umar bin Khattab, that she's trying to understand how much should I give, how much should I not give. And wallahi, it's a stroke of genius when she says, I don't know anything about your son or, or, or this man Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but what if I spoke with your son directly? So she gets the excuse to get to the house of Abu Bakr. Everybody knows what's happened. Everybody knows. How is she going to visit Abu Bakr who is supposed to be an unknown man to her, strange man, but they're all Muslims in Dar al-Arqam. So how is she going to get information? So she uses this line that maybe he's saying things, let me listen to him directly. And subhanAllah, bit by bit then, all of the information comes out. Also we see over here, the usefulness of jahiliyyah, even if some things go against Islam, you can take advantage as long as they're not haram in and of themselves. The, the asabiyyah or the tribalism of the Banu Taym. And not just that, the tribalism of the Banu Hashim to protect the Prophet right? Abu Talib, why did he protect the Prophet He's not a Muslim, but there is this issue of my nephew, my tribe. Nobody's going to harm my tribe. And there's nothing wrong with taking advantage of these issues and understandings because it's not haram to take advantage of these things. And the Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is not saying, no, no, I cannot take advantage of you because you're my tribe. No. And by the way, the same thing applies with nation states, with nationalities, with our rights and privileges. This is now we have our own issues of rights and privileges. Nothing wrong with taking advantage of it and saying, no, it is my right to be treated in this manner. And it is our right. And it is Islamic to take advantage of our right. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq 
takes advantage of his right. I'm a member of the Banu Taim, you're not supposed to be beating me up. His tribe protects him, takes advantage of that, and then nurses him back to, uh, until he is healthy. As well, of course, to me one of the most beautiful lessons we learn from this story is that out of tragedies come great blessings. Wallahi, we all know Abu Bakr as-Siddiq would have done this a hundred times if he would get his mother to embrace Islam. Correct? He would have done this again and again and again and again if he would get his mother to embrace Islam. And this is what happened. That after all of this, the mother's heart, Umm al-Khayr, was so softened, she saw the reality of Iman. She saw what Iman does. She saw how much Abu Bakr believes. She saw the akhlaq of the Muslims. She saw the Prophet Sallallahu preaching and teaching for the first time. Because at, up until this stage, she hasn't heard da'wah directly. Right? And so now, after this tragedy, she embraces Islam. Was it not worth the tragedy? For Abu, from Abu Bakr's eyes, I'm saying. Right? From his perspective, he would have done a hundred times more to get his mother to convert. And so every single tragedy has within it, within it, more blessings than the tragedy itself, as long as we have our trust up there. As long as we put our trust in Allah. Oh Allah, something is happening. I don't know why, but I will know why soon. That's the, the attitude of the, uh, 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 of the believer. That Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, use this, and Allah knows best, maybe he's engineering it, so that his mother goes to the process, right? Allah, we don't know his, what he's thinking, maybe he's intending that I want my mother to come to the Prophet Sallallahu and get da'wah from her one on one, and that is exactly what happened, and so Umm Al-Khair uh, embraces Islam. And uh, another uh, beautiful narration is mentioned as well in our books, and this is a very famous narration which is found in some books of hadith and some books of history. Very beautiful narration and it's very pertinent because this narration is narrated from the tongue of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu in praise of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And as I have said many, many times before, it is, it is completely untrue, unfounded, ludicrous to be honest, to claim that Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala an had anything against Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma. It is there is not a shred of evidence and everything speaks against it. Every incident that we learn and study speaks against it. This is a myth that you're reading in that Abu Bakr and Umar, uh, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhum and, 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 and Uthman and Ali, they didn't somehow get along. This is completely untrue. Everything speaks out against it, including uh, this incident that we're going to mention here, which is mentioned in numerous uh, traditions of ours, and in books of history, Ibn Kathir, for example, his tariq has this uh, narration as well, that once Ali was uh, giving a khutbah amongst the Sahaba in Kufa, amongst the people, when he was the Khalifa, when he was the Khalifa, he's giving uh, a, a sermon or mawidah, I mean some type of lecture, maybe not the Friday khutbah, but some type of sermon or mawidah. And in the middle of it, he asks them, who do you think was the bravest of all people? So they give various names, until somebody, one of them shouts out, you are the most bravest of all people. Ali ibn Abi Talib, you are the most bravest. So Ali radiallahu anhu says, it is true that I have never fought anybody except that I have won him. But the bravest person was Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Nobody ever beat me in a battle, but bravery wise, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was the bravest. Then he said, I remember a day so he's going back to these times of early da'wah, when he himself was young, when he himself was a young child, maybe eight, nine, ten years old. I remember a day when the Quraysh surrounded the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and began beating him and ganging up on him. And not a single one amongst us could do anything because of the sheer quantity. Now this must be, this must be, towards the middle or later Meccan period. Because as we said, they only turned physical on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu after really the sixth or seventh year of da'wah. Right, before this time there was still some, so you know, they're, they're not, so to get physical really got uh, uh, bad. And then with the death of Abu Talib, that was when things really flipped. Abu Talib, Allah Azza wa used him 
to be a big shelter. And it is possible even this incident happened after the death of Abu Talib. Because Ibn Ishaq said that the amount of, 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 of physical uh, pain and suffering that the Prophet had after the death of Abu Talib was, was uh, uh, sorry, before was nothing compared to what happened afterwards. So maybe even this incident happened after the, the death of Abu Talib. We don't know. Again, nobody's recording the history. But this incident is narrated in Ibn Ishaq. And I did mention the story. But now we're hearing it from the tongue of Ali. So Ibn Ishaq mentions the same story that the, the Quraysh ganged up on him and are beating him and Abu Bakr comes to save him. But this version is interesting because we're hearing it as an eyewitness from a young child who was there at the time and that is Ali ibn Abi Talib. So Ali says that on this day everybody surrounded him and began beating him and none of us could do anything but one person stood up and jumped into the, the, the crowd. One person stood up and jumped in, and that was Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And he rushed into the crowd, pushing this one away, defending this one, hitting that one, taking a blow on behalf of the Prophet from another one. And he kept on saying, rajulan an yaqula Rabbi Allah? Are you going to kill a man just because he says, My Lord is Allah? And this phrase, Allah Azza wa Jal revealed it in the Quran, and it is recited in the Quran to this day. Rajun an yaqula Rabbi Allah? Are you going to kill a person just because he says, my Lord is Allah? That's why. And he kept on defending uh, the Prophet ﷺ until the crowd basically abated away. And so Ali is giving this, this mu'id of the sermon and the images are coming back to him. And he began to cry so much in the sermon that he had to lift up his, his uh, cloak and cover his tears with it. And when he cried, the entire uh, audience began to cry as well. Then he said... Who is better, the Mu'minu Adu Fir'aun or Abu Bakr as Siddiq? Now Allah mentions in Surah Ghafir, the Mu'min of Al Fir'aun. You know this, the the Mu'min. You know you should know the story. The 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 one who was a believer in the family of Fir'aun. It's mentioned in the Quran. Who is better, right? And he said, by Allah, Abu Bakr is a million times better because the Mu'min of Al Fir'aun kept his Islam secret. And Abu Bakr made his Islam public. And Abu Bakr made his Islam uh, public. And uh, this clearly shows us the respect and love that Ali ibn Abi Talib had for uh, Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And of course, as well, uh, so many other uh, uh, incidents mentioning that really demonstrate that demonstrate uh, Ali's respect for Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Uh, by the way, of them is an interesting, uh, interesting uh, narration that uh, I mentioned this, I think, two years ago. And last week, as I always mentioned, who did Ali marry? Asma, who was married before Ali to Abu Bakr. And before Abu Bakr, she was married to? Ja'far, ja right? So uh, Asma was married to Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and Abu Bakr and Ali. And she had children from all three. So there are sons that are half-brothers, same mother. And so Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and Ali uh, Ibn uh, Abi Talib, they have children that are basically half uh, siblings, right? What do you call them? Step or half brothers as, as we get the point. So one time, one of the uh, sons of uh, Ja'far and one of the sons of Abu Bakr, right? Began teasing their mother when Ali was present. Their children, family, which shows us the friendly nature that they all had. And they said, who was the best husband you ever had? Now you realize what's happening here, right? This is a problem. What is she going to say? Okay, what is she going to say? Because <laughs> whoever she mentions is going to be a problem, correct? Look at the intelligence of Asma. Look at the intelligence of Asma. So she married Ja'far when she was young, and Ja'far was young. Then, of course, she married Abu Bakr, and Abu Bakr is 62 years old, okay? So she said, of the young men, Shab, Ja'far was the best. And of the shuyukh, of the old ones, Abu Bakr was the best. So Ali said, then what have you left for me? I'm gone, khalas. You took the young, the old, I'm gone now. So the point being, now even this narration, by the way, subhanAllah, what does it really show? The family, the, like, the closeness, the relationship, right? I mean, the claim, wallahi, that there was hatred, animosity, it is just bizarre. If you read every single narration, it's nothing but 
actual love and respect for the uh, for each other. In any case, back to uh, the, the the point over here. So Abu Bakr as Siddiq, as we said, therefore he was the first to call to Islam. He was the first to suffer physically after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was the first to give his money. He was the first to advise the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was the first to free slaves from his own money. And he freed over 10 of the early slaves that embraced Islam. He freed over 10 of them. And Bilal is just one of those names. In fact, he freed over 10 of them, and when he embraced Islam, he cut down his business dealings. And therefore, the fact of the matter is that he no longer had the source of income that he had in the days pre-Islam. Because he stopped traveling to Syria and back, so from a limited amount of money, he spent generously and freely. And Allah Azza wa Jal gave him back because he had that trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, we'll mention uh, one more a very important story, uh, and that is the story of uh, Ibn al-Daghina, Ibn al-Daghina and the hijrah of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. So as we know, in the fifth year of the hijrah, uh, sorry, fifth year of the da'wah, not hijrah, in the fifth year of the da'wah, our Prophet sallallahu allowed the Muslims to emigrate to Abyssinia. And one by one, they all began to emigrate. And Abu Bakr as well decided to take advantage of this. So he packed his belongings and with his wife and children basically made his way outside of Mecca. And Allah Azza wa Jal willed that the chieftain of the Ahabish, now pause here. Uh, the Ahabish are mentioned a number of times and they are considered to be the nomads of the Quraysh outside of Mecca. So you have the dwellers of the city, then you have the dwellers around. And the Ahabish joined the Quraysh for many times. For example, in the Battle of Badr, they gave a few hundred. Especially in the Battle of Ahzab, thousands of them marched with uh, the Quraysh to support the Quraysh against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Ahabish are basically the surrounding nomadic tribes. And they have a very strong relationship, even bloodline. A few, I don't know how I forgot how many, but so many generations back, obviously they go back with the Quraysh. So the Quraysh and them are cousin or third cousin, whatever types of tribes. So the Ahabish are the outer dwellers. And the Quraysh are the inner dwellers. And of course, there is this, com there is this notion that the Quraysh are superior to them. Obviously, you get the point. Because the Ahabish are the nomads and the ones out there. So Abu Bakr passes by Ibn al-Daghina. And Ibn al-Daghina is the chieftain of the Ahabish. And he sees all of the belongings and the camels and the bags and everything. So he said, where are you leaving, O Abu Bakr? So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq says, I am leaving my land in order to worship my Lord because my people have prevented me. I can't be a Muslim and worship Allah properly. I'm going to Abyssinia, basically. So Ibn al-Daghina says, someone like you, la yakhruj wa la yukhruj. He can neither leave Mecca nor can he be forced out of Mecca. And then he listed, and I mentioned this last week, the same things that Khadija radiallahu anha said about our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You are good to your relatives. And you feed the orphan. And you take care of the poor. And you fulfill your promise. And you uh, do everything that the people need you to do. You're loving to your, your friends and relatives. All of these descriptions. She, he actually used the same words, or almost the same words, that Khadija radiallahu anha used to describe the Prophet sallallahu And he basically said, you're too good to leave Mecca. I can't let you leave Mecca. Let me go and negotiate with the Quraysh. So, they went back right then and there. And Ibn al-Daghina did tawaf, that was the custom, that whenever you entered Mecca you would do tawaf. This is still our custom as well, for our sharia as well. That was the custom. And then he called the leaders of Mecca. He's the chieftain. He has that right to, you know, make a proclamation. And he said, would you agree and allow me to give Abu Bakr the right and protection to stay in Mecca? Now, remember, so many times we have talked about this, that the chieftains had the right to give visas, basically. And when you gave the visa, the aman, when you gave the, the visa, nobody could harm you without the chieftain getting involved. And it becomes a matter of honor and pride that imagine now, even in nation states, right? If an American citizen is mistreated, then all of America technically should get involved. Technically, should get involved. 
and it should negotiate on your behalf and whatnot. It's a matter of pride that this was an American who was mistreated. So similarly, and so look at the open the passport, you know the first thing, that the bearer of this passport shall go without any, so that's basically the aman. But instead of a passport, you have the chieftain giving it. So the, the, what this implies is that a time had come that Abu Bakr's father and the chieftain, the Banu Taim's chieftain basically says to Abu Bakr, you're no longer welcome with us. So Abu Bakr has to now leave. So he doesn't have protection. So Ibn Daghina then goes and says, can I give him my protection? Will you honor my word? And if the Quraysh said yes, then they are in trouble if they break it. And it's going to be war between the Quraysh and the Ahabish. Not because of Abu Bakr, because of honor and pride. Because it's my word and you broke it. Okay. So the Quraysh said, that is your right, but we have one condition. What was the condition? He cannot read Quran out loud in public and he cannot pray in front of the Kaaba that's our condition he can do whatever he wants in his house but he cannot read Quran or pray because we find the hearts of our children and our women are swaying and they want to embrace the faith the Sufaha amongst us and our children and women they are being swayed by Abu Bakr and his recitation and Aisha is narrating and said, and Abu Bakr was rajulun bakka. He would always cry when he is reading the Quran. He would be very emotional as he's reading the Quran, and the people would be mesmerized by that uh, crying. And so uh, Abu Bakr agreed. Ibn Daghina said, Do you agree? Abu Bakr agreed that I'm not going to re read in front of the Kaaba and read uh, out loud on the streets. So he then decided to build a small chamber. A type of, uh, if you like, storage room or whatever, not a storage room, but like an extension of his house where he could worship Allah, like a mini masjid. That there's the, a shed, okay, khalas, a shed, okay, a little bit of a place where he could worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, space is limited, so the direction of the shed was the direction of the road. It's not as if he has a big backyard, so he has to go towards the road. So he made a small chamber where there was space to pray, and he would begin to recite the Quran and pray in there. And people began gathering around that little chamber, crying with the crying of Abu Bakr, and being moved by the recitation of Abu Bakr. And so the Quraysh sent an emissary to Ibn Daghina and said to him that either you tell Abu Bakr to <laughs> destroy that shed, right, and go to the middle of his house so that nobody can, or get rid of your protection so that we can basically deal with him, okay? So now Ibn Daghina is put in between, in between these, this awkward situation. So he sends an emissary, or he either goes or he sends an emissary to Abu Bakr. Actually, one, we don't know. Either he sends or he goes. And he basically says to Abu Bakr, look, this is what your people have said to me. So you choose. Either you go to the middle of your house and abandon your shed, right? Or if you insist, then I'm going to have to withdraw my protection. And so Abu Bakr Siddiq said that, I take away my protection from you and I put Allah as my protector. That khalas, okay. You go and Allah will be the one who gives me a man, right? And so after this, he along with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, both of them did not have that visa. Remember that was why our Prophet was going places. That there was no person after the death of Abu Talib basically for a while, remember I said this, for a few weeks uh, Abu Lahab agreed to out of Jahiliya, like I kind of have to but then even he said, okay I cannot do this anymore and he withdrew the protection. So it is so amazing that of all of the Sahaba, so many similarities that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and the Prophet ﷺ, the both of them they are living without a man under the aman of Allah subhanahu uh, wa ta'ala and this shows us the uh, iman of Abu Bakr uh, al-Siddiq. And uh, the final thing that we'll mention, and I'm not going to go into this in detail because alhamdulillah, uh, we went into this in an entire episode of the seerah. So you can listen to the entire episode. And that is the story of the hijrah of the process and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. I'm not going to go into that at all because it's completely, we went into it in as exhaustive detail, inshallah, as humanly possible. We talked about the fact that Abu Bakr wanted to migrate and the process kept on saying, Wait, perhaps Allah has chosen a partner for you. And he didn't click because he didn't, he never imagined that he would be given that privilege. But when it came, Aisha, remember this, one of Aisha's first memories, radiallahu anha. And what did Aisha say? The famous phrase? 
Wallahi, I never believed that somebody could cry out of happiness until I saw my father crying the day that the Prophet told him, you could migrate with me. Right? So Aisha remembers, she must have been four or five at the time, she remembers. This is the, one of her first memories. And the fact that Abu Bakr had two camels prepared, that um, his son Abdullah participated, Asma broke, uh, you know, the the and the, the, she, she broke her, she tore her belt into two, used one to tie and, and gave not. His servant Amir ibn Fuhaira is in on the plot. So really Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and his family engineer the entire hijrah. The entire hijrah is really Allah Azza wa chose Abu Bakr as-Siddiq to engineer the entire hijrah. And I uh, want to conclude on this ayah in the Quran, which is uh, in Surah At-Tawbah, that إِلَّا تَنْصُرُوهُ فَقَدَ نَصَرَهُ اللَّهُ if you do not help the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then know that Allah has already helped him. Allah has already helped him. إِذْ أَخْرَجَهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا When the kuffar kicked him out, expelled him. ثَانِيَ اثْنَيْنِ The second of the two. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq has been called one of the two. And by text of the Qur'an, Allah has used Abu Bakr to help the Prophet ﷺ. If none of you help him, then Allah has already helped him. When the kuffar kicked him out, and he and his partner, Thani Athnaini, and therefore one of the titles of Abu Bakr is Thani Athnain, because he is the second of the two. The one of them is the Prophet the other one is Thani Athnain. He is the second of the two. ثَانِيَ اثْنَيْنِ إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ When the two of them were in the cave, إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ When he, the Prophet ﷺ, said to his sahib, لَا تَحْزَنْ Don't worry. إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا Allah is with us. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ so Allah sent his sakina down upon him. وَأَيَّدَهُ بِجُنُودٍ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا And Allah helped him with an army that you cannot see. Now this verse is one of the most explicit verses testifying to the praise of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. How so? First and foremost, as I said, Allah Azza wa Jal is explicitly saying that Abu Bakr has been used by him to help Rasulullah. None of you else did it. But I have already helped him when the two of them. So Allah Azza wa Jal is putting him with the Prophet. Then Allah Azza wa Jal calls him Sahib. No other Sahabi has been called Sahib by Allah other than Abu Bakr as Siddiq. That doesn't mean they're not. But it means it's an honor for Abu Bakr as Siddiq to be called Sahabi. Anybody who denies that Abu Bakr is a Sahabi has rejected the Qur'an. إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ When he said to his Sahib. So Allah has affirmed Suhba, which is companionship for our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As well, Allah has demonstrated that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cares for Abu Bakr. إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ Don't worry. And you only tell somebody, don't worry, calm down, when you care about them. So Allah has affirmed the love that Rasulullah has for Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. إِذْ يَقُولُ صَاحِبِي لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا The Prophet Muhammad Wasallam is saying, Allah is with the two of us. Can there be any praise higher than this? Allah and the Prophet and Abu Bakr. Inna Allah ma'ana. Allah is with us. And therefore this phrase in particular is the highest praise given to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an. That on the tongue of the Prophet Muhammad as he is saying, Allah is with us. Imagine. I mean, well, I don't even need to explain to you how beautiful this is, how powerful this is. That Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us in the Quran, Rasulullah Sallallahu is saying that Allah is with us. And he said us, Abu Bakr is him, us. He's putting Abu Bakr together. That Allah Azza wa Jal is with us. And then the ending of the ayah, so Allah sent down Sakina. And when that Sakina came, Abu Bakr is there. 
and Allah helped him. And when the help came, Abu Bakr is there and Abu Bakr is being used as the help as well. And therefore, this verse in Surah At-Tawbah is a verse that has full praise of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And with that, inshaAllah ta'ala, we come to uh, the end of today's and inshaAllah, next week we will continue and talk about, inshaAllah, we will do as much as we can about the life of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq before the Khilafah. And then after that, we'll summarize some of the salient features of the Khilafah. As I said, I, I went into some detail here, but inshallah when it comes to the political issues of the Khilafah, we'll just have to zoom over a little bit uh, and mention whatever we have time for.